closeness without confinement after narcissistic abuse. Does it feel impossible to live life without orienting to external demands? Do you find it difficult to know what you want for yourself? And do you wonder what the outcome of recovery from narcissistic abuse should look and feel like? Well, the scapegoat child's most pressing issue is to feel like their parent is willing to be there for them. It's a full-time job to convince themselves that the parent is in fact there. This job requires a lot of denial and effort to be who that parent needs them to be. In exchange, the child gets temporary relief from the gnawing reality that their narcissistic parent is in fact incapable of being there for them in the way the child needs. The scapegoat child learned that having someone there meant being emotional nourishment for that other person. Relationships where two people are equally important offer something very different. Now, each person is responsible for nourishing themselves, but nobody is alone. It is a process and sometimes a challenge to get used to this for scapegoat survivors. In today's video, I explain how scapegoat survivors can move from closeness feeling coercive to empowering. There are two components to this healing process. First is structuring one's environment to prevent further harm. Second is switching from the life purpose of avoiding catastrophic isolation to pursuing what you need and want. This means discovering an entirely new way of being close to other people, a way that does not require sacrifice of yourself, but offers mutual benefit. You get to take the other's willingness to be there for granted. This allows you to remain in contact with yourself while being with the other person. I'll describe the process of making this switch and use an anonymized case example to illustrate. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California and I specialize in recovery from narcissistic abuse. In my professional and personal experience, I've worked to identify the fundamentals to the process of recovery. And this has led me to what I call the three pillars of recovery. Pillar number one is making sense of what happened so that ultimately you know it's not your fault. Pillar number two is moving away from narcissistic abusers and towards safe people. And pillar number three is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. I think it's also essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. I've both seen and experienced large improvements in quality of life after applying these pillars. I also want to mention that I'm offering a new free ebook called Four Ways to Heal for Adult Scapegoat Survivors. And in it, I offer four strategies to reclaim your authentic self from the fake and painful scapegoat identity, learn and apply the science behind gaining distance from narcissistic abusers, know the secret to reducing social anxiety for scapegoat survivors, and accept yourself as the fallible and valuable person you are. You can find the link to the free ebook in the description box below. Two components that lead to empowered closeness. The first component is to restructure your environment to prevent further harm. As the saying goes, safety first. In simplest terms, this restructuring is necessary in order to undo prior learning. The scapegoat child learned that catastrophic aloneness occurs when they do not meet their narcissistic parents' coercive demands. The scapegoat child who rightfully expects their parent to meet their needs faces this kind of aloneness. So the child learns that a really bad outcome happens if they expect to be treated well. They also learn that they can prevent that bad outcome by expecting nothing and giving everything to their narcissistic parent. The scapegoat survivor must restructure their environment to remove situations and people that reinforce the old learning. They must also populate their environment with people and experiences that allow for new learning. This first component is what the three pillars of recovery are in fact all about. The first pillar of making sense of what happened allows you to become more aware of the old learning. The second pillar offers tactics to move away from those who reinforce the old learning and towards those who do not. And the third pillar, living in defiance of the narcissist rules, 
facilitates experiences of feeling adequate and deserving without losing the goodwill of important others in their life. After the first component for recovery is in place, the second is to live for the purpose of fulfillment. This means switching the goal of life from avoiding catastrophic aloneness to being fully yourself. To do so, the scapegoat survivor must be convinced that their most important relationships will not be threatened if they do so. They can take others' goodwill towards them for granted and pursue what brings them fulfillment. Well, let's look at another anonymized case example to illustrate. Sonia grew up with a narcissistic mother who intruded into most aspects of her life. When Sonia was at home, her mother would inevitably barge into her room and demand she finish her chores. These chores made up an exhaustive list that seemed impossible to Sonia to ever get done. She also preserved a vestige of her own identity by passively not doing the entire list of chores. This allowed her to know that she existed for reasons beyond just doing her mother's bidding. Well, Sonia's adolescence was marred by getting berated at home, then having to serve out long sentences of being grounded. Her friendships and relationships at school suffered because she couldn't socialize outside of school due to all the grounding. She found herself feeling like her time was not her own. She'd make schedules for herself that detailed what she was going to do and accomplish in her free time. Earmarking time to study and exercise gave her a semblance of feeling like her time was her own. She could only schedule activities, though, that kept her at home, or she would have been a target for her mother's attack. Well, Sonia eventually moved away to go to college. In her first year, she took an abnormal psychology class and had to do a report on narcissistic personality disorder, of all things. As she was doing research, she stumbled upon the Reddit thread raised by narcissists. She saw the first heading on the, on the thread was, did your in parent yell at you about chores? And in on this thread sub, is a shorthand for narcissist or narcissistic. And she went on to read about some, someone describing something that was almost exactly what she experienced at the hands of her mother. She found more and more points in common as she con continued to read through the thread. She was blown away. She felt like a new portal in the world had opened for her, one where she might not be the real problem. Her mind could only get glimpses, though, of what this portal might offer her. It just upended too much of what she had taken as fact for so long. This moment, though, led her to find and consume as much information as she could about narcissistic abuse. She learned that a narcissistic person often acts intrusively in relationships. She saw in her mother the sense of entitlement that led to treating Sonia as if she was a piece of property. It just all made so much sense. But Sonia still struggled with feeling constricted and worth less than others. She knew that she needed help and decided to go to her university's counseling center. She told her therapist about her discovery from Reddit and the rest of the information and worried, though, that, she, that their therapist would uh, see her as the problem. Instead, her therapist showed genuine interest in what Sonia's upbringing had been like. Sonia got to tell her story to another human being for the first time in her life. It felt strange, provoking, and somewhat relieving. Sonia would work with this therapist for the rest of her time as an undergraduate. They developed a new frame of reference for what Sonia could and should expect from others. Sonia found her feelings of hurt and resentment at one particular friend's dismissiveness validated by her therapist. Instead of Sonia seeing herself as too sensitive, she located the issue in her friend's lack of emotional generosity. Sonia began moving away from such people in her life. She also found herself moving towards people who seemed to like her and want to be around her. In Sonia's senior year, she began to question her practice of schedule making. She grew curious about how her days might go if she didn't so rigorously control her time. When she noticed the impulse to create a schedule, she shifted her attention to something else. And over time, she shared with her therapist how she felt more free as a result. Well, Sonia put the three pillars of recovery into action in her life. 
She made sense of what happened in a way that located the problem in her mother's psychopathology instead of Sonia's supposed bad character. Sonia also moved away from her mother's narcissistic abuse and the, that of her dismissive friend. She moved towards her therapist and friends who readily liked her. And finally, she defied her mother's narcissistic rule that her time was not her own by practicing and experimenting with living without making so many schedules. Overcoming what closeness used to have to mean. In order for the scapegoat child to feel like their narcissistic parent was there, they had to sacrifice themselves. This meant being who the parent required them to be. The parent required the child to seem, however, would boost the parent's inflated yet fragile self-worth. And typically this meant the child adopting the belief that they are defective, that that child is defective and or undeserving. Doing so allowed the narcissistic parent to relocate their own intolerable sense of worthlessness into the child. The scapegoat child learns that taking on their narcissistic parent's bad feelings would maximize the parent's viability as their caretaker. The narcissistic parent with a stabilized self-worth can parent much better than one who is drowning in their own emotional pain. This form of closeness is based on coercion. Neither the parent nor the child has any faith that the other will be there for them of their own accord. The parent's fearfulness of not having the fuel they need to keep themselves propped up leads to them forcing the child into the role of being emotional fuel for them. Meanwhile, the child's fear of not having a parent leads them to coerce themselves into being the parent's fuel in this regard. As this mode of closeness gets practiced over and over, it can grow to be confused with connection. Freely chosen closeness does not have a place in this kind of world. No one gets to feel like they are close because they have something in themselves that is genuinely valued by the other person. What closeness can mean now. To make the switch to empowered closeness, you must have faith that important others are operating in the same way. Yes, you are your own fuel for your life, and so are they for their lives. In this world, each person is responsible for filling and using their own gas tank, but no one is alone. Though focused on their own fulfillment, they are also present for one another. This form of presence is and feels very different from the coercive presence of a narcissistic parent. In this world, no one is forced to be there for someone else. Part of being free to choose and pursue your own fulfillment allows you to notice and act on your, on your desires to give and receive support. This freedom allows you to conclude that the other person is there because that person wants to be. And if someone else is choosing to show up for you, then it must be because there is something in you that is very valuable. This conclusion sets one up for a very sturdy and mobile basis for self-worth. No matter how hard you push in your own direction, you get to know you are not alone because there's something inside you that important people are drawn to, important people to you are drawn to. You are not forgotten. Well, let's go back to Sonia to illustrate this part of the process. She had continued her healing trajectory after college. She took a job in, in a city far away from her hometown. She continued to experiment with exercising her personal freedom. She nurtured the friendships where she was treated well and avoided those where she was not. At her job, she found herself drawn to a coworker named Matt. She found it very easy to talk to him and she noticed that she felt very relaxed around him. He seemed interested in what she had to say and got her wry sense of humor. One day, Matt asked her if she'd like to get a cup of coffee with him and she agreed. Well, this led to a dating relationship and Sonia found herself sharing more with Matt than she ever had in, in a relationship. She also wanted to know as much as she could about him. Sonia was caught off guard by Matt finding whatever was important to her to seemingly be important to him. He'd show her that he thought about her during their time apart by telling her a follow-up thought about something that they had discussed that was important to her in her life. Sonia found herself indulging in long-submerged interests. 
She had always enjoyed drawing and began, began to do so after work. She half expected Matt to lament her taking up yet another hobby and even be resentful of her doing so. He continued, though, to helpfully disconfirm these expectations by being excited that she had found a new interest. All the while, Matt was contentedly pursuing his own aims in life. He found purpose in his job and liked to talk about what he was working on. He prioritized his close friends and carved out time to spend with them. He enjoyed woodworking, too, and would spend time after dinner on various projects. Sonia found herself interested in what Matt found interesting in his own life, too. She liked to check in on him and his woodworking and see what he was creating. They would discuss his projects at dinner sometimes as well. Well, as Matt and Sonia built a life together, they did so with very different bricks and mortar than what Sonia was used to. Matt and Sonia's relationship was built on their mutual and ongoing willingness to be there for themselves and for each other. They knew that taking care of themselves did not take away from the other person. And they got to have faith in the other's continued goodwill as they pursued what they found fulfilling. Well, in today's video, I really wanted to kind of try to illustrate what uh, one form of the process of healing from narcissistic abuse and uh, what closeness means in a narcissistically abusive relationship uh, can look and feel like. If you find that some of that uh, sense of coerciveness kind of resonates, then I hope you might find some of the content today useful. Thank you again for tuning in uh, and for your continued support of, of this channel and you know the resources that surround it. Your continued support of one another. I think courageous, heartening, and thought-provoking comments about uh, your own experience is just, again, it's, I say this every week, but uh, it's incredible to read. Well, from Brizo back there and myself, we look forward to posting again next Friday. Take care.